Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to my channel, Kalanadi. Today I'm going to review Sideshow by Sherry S. Tepper. This is the final novel in the Arby trilogy. Unlike the first two books, it cannot be read as a standalone. Both Grass, the first book, and Raising the Stones, which is the second book, really can be read as standalones. Um, they're pretty complete stories on their own that don't depend heavily on knowledge from other books. However, Sideshow definitely pulls in ideas, events, and characters from previous books. And in particular, I think you need to read Raising the Stones first because the Hobbes land gods are introduced in that one and you really need to know about those. So I'm going to try to describe what this book is about and what's going on in it without actually spoiling the two previous books. So I may have to be a bit vague about the actual plot. In this book, it is said that the planet elsewhere is the last refuge of humanity. People on elsewhere believe that they are free from the Hobbes land gods and that their home is the only place that the gods have not infected and enslaved. And the people of elsewhere really do deeply fear the Hobbes land gods. They truly believe that if they were to come in contact with them, they would be completely enslaved and no longer human. Maybe a good way of summarizing the plot of this book is that it is what happens to elsewhere when it comes under threat from both gods externally as well as internally. There is an expedition to kind of a terra incognita on the planet called Panubi, where it is believed they may come in contact with at least emissaries from the Hobbes land gods and the rest of the universe, and they need to know whether they're kind of under attack from this threat or not. But at the same time, the very foundation of elsewhere, the very concept of the planet, and all of the societies on it are under threat from the emergence of their own gods. These evil forces that may be tied to the very founding of the planet, the very colonization of the planet. And will they survive both of these threats? So most of the book is actually taken up with that expedition to Panubi. So I have to explain a bit about how Elsewhere is set up. It's been colonized by multiple distinct human societies and they have over time developed this kind of perverted definition of diversity and always maintaining diversity. What that essentially means is that any human society has its own province, its own territory, and within that territory, they get to do whatever they want and nobody can stop them. There are enforcers, kind of the police force of elsewhere, and their only real mandate is to stop the provinces from interfering with each other. But this doesn't mean that they stop atrocities, that they actually stop what we would consider to be crimes. For example, there is one of these societies called Moloch that practices widespread ritualistic torture and sacrifice of children en masse. Everyone knows that they do this. Nobody actually considers it to be a crime. They only commit a crime if they take a child from a different province, basically transporting them across country borders in a way and kill them. That's the crime. It is all about maintaining the status quo and this concept of diversity, which is not what we think of as actual diversity. It reads more like defending people's right to be as absolutely awful and horrific to each other as they want, as long as it doesn't interfere with somebody else's business. So really, it's a plan that's all about staying out of other people's business. But there is no justice, there are no human rights, there is no empathy. And that becomes, I think, a major theme of the book that the characters try to discuss 
but in my opinion, they never really get anywhere with that, which may be one of the big disappointments of the novel for me. The main cast of characters, like I said, are going on this expedition to Panubi to no place to find out what is there. Um, there are a couple of enforcers on that expedition. There is Danovan, who is kind of an awful person. There is Fringe, who she may be one of the most interesting and yet ill-used characters in this novel. There's a man named Curvis, who you can completely ignore. He literally just disappears at the end of the book. Um, then there are two very mysterious ancient people, a woman named Jory and her companion, a man named Asner. You will know who they are if you've read the previous books. And then there are the conjoined twins from 20th Century Earth who kind of got time traveled to the far future through an Arbi door. And those conjoined twins are Nella, who has been raised as a woman, and Bertrand, who has been raised as a man. And if you know anything about conjoined twins, you're like, that's not possible. You can't have a, a man and a woman as a conjoined twin. They're always the same sex, basically. But they have had biological sex uh, surgically assigned to them when they were born. It's very complicated. And that's another one of my issues with this book is how the how the conjoined twins are handled, the whole thing about them going off to be in a freak show and a circus, and their issues with gender, and how obviously they've been gendered by their raising and by their environment and all of that. You could write an entire book just about that and analyzing how it's done here. I'm not gonna go super far into that. It's not really my area but it bothered me. So this motley crew of people are all headed to some place where they don't know what they're going to find. And as they are traveling through the provinces to this place, the planet and human societies are kind of breaking down. Everything is falling apart around them as they come under attack from their own emerging godlike forces, which seem pretty inexplicable. This is like 300 pages of setup, which is not super unusual for Tepper's books. Her books usually have many, many moving parts, many concepts and characters and points of view that will all eventually coalesce and come together. In this book, however, everything just felt very artificial. I was buddy reading this with my friend Joe. We've read a bunch of Tepper's novels together and we both agreed there was something really not working about the way this story was being written and told. It's like you could see Tepper behind the scenes maneuvering everything into place just so, so that it would do what she wanted it to do. And so it didn't feel natural. It just felt very fake. And that is in stark contrast to Raising the Stones, which I personally think sidesteps a lot of the flaws that I've noticed in Tepper's work before. This just came right back to some of the weird gender essentialist stuff in Tepper's novels, some of the almost, I think, like internalized misogyny and the really unsatisfactory way she has of presenting masculine and feminine things in societies. It's very dark and black and white about how I think Tepper envisioned that societies and humans would just fall apart and become nasty and evil without any interference from some sort of higher power. And I don't actually agree with a lot of this stuff. So yeah, this book just has so many of the things that I think are very typical of Tepper's books that she kind of did a better job of handling in a more subtle way and raising the stones, but we're right back to it being pretty heavy handed and obvious in this particular book. And then the ending, just there's a revelation about the nature of the gods, both the Hobbes land gods, as well as the gods of elsewhere. And I did not either really believe one of them and the other one, 
about the Hobbesland gods was just incredibly disappointing to me. I thought in some ways it was like a story cop-out, a little, a little bit like deus ex machina and we're all going to be saved by the machine because we can't save ourselves and I was just so unhappy with that particular reasoning and explanation for things. I really just wanted to remember raising the stones on its own. And then I really hated what happened to some of the characters. I did not find really many of the characters to be sympathetic or very well done. In particular, I hated Danovan. He is that very smug kind of guy who knows he's very physically attractive and he becomes angry when women don't immediately fall in lust with him. He is quite taken with Fringe when he meets her for the first time, and he, at one point, it literally says in the text that he begins to contemplate assault or rape when she doesn't respond to him physically in the way that he wants her to. And I, this may be a spoiler, but I'm going to warn you right now, he rapes her. There's a scene which I think is very obviously rape, and then the fact that Tepper writes them as kind of having a romantic relationship and real feelings of love for each other afterwards made me want to vomit. I thought that was so gross, and Danovan never redeemed himself in any way after that. Um, and then what happens to Fringe? No spoilers, but... She was probably the character that had the most potential for me. She really was complex and interesting and flawed and very difficult. She didn't understand herself either, and there was so much that could have been done with her character. And what I thought actually happened to her at the end was just sad and nowhere near as good as it could have actually been. Maybe I should stop there before I rant about too many things, but I honestly did not think that this book worked very well from beginning to end. It does have many interesting elements about it. It was never boring. This is the thing I will always praise Tepper's novels for. I've never read a boring story by her before. They may not succeed, I may not like them very much, but they're never boring. Kind of a disappointing end to the Arby series for me. I really do recommend only reading Raising the Stones. Read Grass first if you're really interested in it, but I don't think it's a super great novel either. Mm, some people may really disagree with me on that one though. But Raising the Stones in particular was good and probably better if you don't have Sideshow in your memory to ruin it all for you. Sorry if I sound very harsh about this one, but it's not fun to have a book that you loved so much kinda ruined by the last book in a series. So that is pretty much everything I have to say about Sideshow for right now. I'll be interested to know if anybody has read this book and what you think about it versus the first two novels in the series. So thank you very much for watching this rant slash review. I'll be back tomorrow with another video for Vlogmas, and until then, bye.